and I sometimes do afterwards just because I've agreed to give a little interview at two o'clock, so I'll just have to go down the road in order to do that. We're dealing with the case of slavery this week, and at first, if you take the guidance of Paul's letter to the Galatians, you might think that we're on a track similar to what produced the successful revolution against infanticide that we discussed last week. But as it turns out, that promising start rather quickly turns problematic and even, as I suggest in the title, paradoxical. By paradoxical, what I mean is we'll see by the end of the period, Christianity is both criticizing slavery and at the same time justifying it, which in my opinion accounts for why it is that certain nations, above all the United States, have had difficulty coming to grips with this institution. So it's my hope that by considering this development in the early stages of Christianity, we'll come better to understand a cultural feature in the West overall. So to begin with the promising start that Paul makes writing to the Galatians, there is not one Jew or Greek, not one slave or free, not one male or female, because you are all one in Jesus Christ. In saying this, Paul is identifying principal structures of the Roman Empire of his time, and is saying that there is something about the corporate nature of believers together that defies those usual structures. And the reason he argues that, as he makes clear in Galatians, is as a result of baptism. In his view, along with the view of other believers in his time, baptism was a moment in which each and every believer, at this time an adult, accepts the Spirit of God and is therefore guided prophetically. The very ground of Christian ethics during this period is that of prophecy. That is, the understanding that the individual is guided by means of the Spirit, and the same Spirit animates the corporate body of the Church, so that the entire commonality of believers stands as something apart from the world at large. And the world at large, ironically, cooperated in this self-understanding in that there was, at the very least, great bias against Christianity as being a superstitio, not a legal religion, and at times reacts to Christianity by means of open persecution. It is much easier to see yourself as a part under those circumstances. And also one is readier to understand that the cost one is paying as being the cost that prophets historically have always had to pay. The distinctive feature of Christianity during this period is the claim that the Spirit of God is openly available to those who are immersed in the Spirit. This is a distinct understanding of what immersion means. It had been a ritual of cleansing within Judaism. It now becomes a ritual of receiving the Spirit. And one that assumes that every single believer is animated by Spirit. Once it had been thought that selected prophets, or the king, or the high priest, or at Qumran, the teacher of righteousness, were specially guided by spirit. Now the claim is being made that this spirit has been shed abroad 
and that those people who accept it are now guided by spirit. It's no wonder that the church at this stage is not a hierarchical institution. How would you go about trying to organize an entire group of prophets? It's even more difficult than trying to manage a faculty. So how will we live in this world then in which we understand ourselves as part of an order, the order of spirit, that does not observe these basic structures? Paul also has to address that question, which he does in his first letter to the Corinthians. These are letters written just with a delay of three years. So it's quite clear that he is thinking through this social situation quite coherently. There is no very drastic development between Galatians and 1 Corinthians as concerns the social location of early Christianity. One possible way, you might think, to respond to the claim that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, is to try to revolt against those structures. But this is not the way of Christianity in the first century or indeed in the early centuries. It has the capacity within its own order to elevate women to positions of leadership, and that occurs at an extremely early stage. One can see that within the pages of the New Testament and also within frescoes in the catacombs in Rome. We can also make the assertion that within this particular fellowship, Jew and Greek are equal, and we can state that anyone who is a slave out there is not a slave in here. And those who have ownership of others only do so in the world's terms and not ours. And one reason for taking this attitude towards these structures is that the very attempt to revolt against them has within living memory been proven to be a disaster. The third servile revolt, as it is called, between the years 73 and 71, before the Common Era, this is the revolt of Spartacus, had resulted in a disaster for a very well-organized slave army. But in a way, something even more drastic occurred as a result of that revolt. Crassus was the general who finally crushed Spartacus, and he did so with the aid of an already well-known warrior, Pompey. Following that revolt, they both rose in the esteem of Rome, and of course, they would form two of the members of the triumvirate with Julius Caesar. The empire itself was to some extent formed as a response to slavery on the understanding that part of the empire's controlling power had to include dealing with this issue. For this reason, you do not have yet established a strategy for dealing with the question of slavery as an evil as you did have a strategy for dealing with infanticide quite apart from Judaism and Christianity. Slavery is not seen at this stage as an evil by most Roman authors. Instead, it is those who would attempt to overturn the institution who are seen as a threat. So we live in a world in which we don't think these are institutions that God observes, and yet in which there doesn't seem to be an active alternative to them. So how do you cope in such a world? 
Paul writes to the Corinthians in chapter 7, every person remain in the calling one was called in. Were you a slave when you were called? What does that matter? Yet, if you are able to become free, take the opportunity. For the slave called is the Lord's freed person. Likewise, a free person is Christ's slave. And he applies this logic to other major institutions, such as marriage, which is why he says a few verses on, I declare this kindred, time is winding up. That is, this age is coming to an end. Time is winding up. For the rest, those who have wives should be as those who do not, those who weep as those who do not, those who rejoice as those who do not, those who buy as not possessing, those who use the world as not exploiting it, because the form of this world passes away. It is all going in any case, and therefore your adjustment to it is purely of a provisional nature. And Christianity, during its early period, developed its peculiar ethic precisely within that worldview. And it's a worldview that largely predominated until the fourth century, and the decision of Constantine, whom we've mentioned before, to tolerate Christianity, but then to more than tolerate Christianity, to make it de facto the religion of the empire, a status which was confirmed as a matter of law by the end of the fourth century. But in the particular letter he writes to a governor named Elpidius in 321, you can see one of the ways in which Constantine effectuates a rule which promotes Christianity and at the same time deals with the question of slavery. Just as we thought it most unfitting that the day of the sun, we call that Sunday for that very reason, that the day of the sun with its venerable rites should be given over to swearing and counter-swearing of litigants and their unseemly brawls. What's he saying here? Constantine has suspended courts on Sundays on the grounds that courts are unseemly. See, they even were in the fourth century. You don't want to hear this back and forth of litigants. You don't want the small time operators trying to get their due from someone else on the day of the sun when people should be at worship. Well, they're only going to be at worship if they're followers of Christ. No one else is doing it. He's not saying this about the Sabbath. He's not saying this about any of the holidays of the classical gods. He is saying it about Sundays. So the background of this is his decision, this is going to be a holiday. But now he's going to modify that decision. And he goes on to say, so it is a pleasant and joyful thing to fulfill petitions of special urgency on that day. Therefore, on that festal day, let all be allowed to perform manumission and emancipation. And let nothing that concerns this be forbidden. That is, there'll be no courts in session except for purposes of emancipation. And that's an especially telling edict because it's precisely in this time that Constantine also makes the decision. The leaders of individual congregations, those priests who used to be the first to be persecuted as a result of the Edict of Diocletian, the predecessor of Constantine, those priests are going to be magistrates. 
they are going to be judges. And this is one reason that they don't ordinarily sit in court on Sundays. They have other things to do. But he's saying on those days, clearly as a part of worship, they can engage in manumission and emancipation. Obviously, this is an encouragement to the act of emancipation, and it is an empowerment of clergy. But with this empowerment of clergy, which incidentally is still operates today, this is why clergy marry people. Somewhere along the line, a disastrous mistake was made, and they didn't give us the divorce business, otherwise we'd be doing a lot better than we are. We, we simply get the marriage part as a kind of remnant of this conception that being a member of the clergy carries with it the powers of a magistrate. But there are certain qualifications for magistry, right? Only men can be magistrates. And it's from this time that only men are accepted for ordination to the priesthood. When the empire embraces you as a religion, whatever that religion is, you also embrace the empire. And that has an impact on the institution of slavery, but also in many other ways. Perhaps most obviously, in the way in which Christianity, during precisely this period, fully accepts in a revised form the old imperial philosophy, namely Stoicism. The Stoic understanding articulated for example, by Musonius Rufus, who we saw last week, has it that the emperor has the right of rule because he represents the logos, the underlying word or logic by which society is governed and nature itself is coordinated. It is a supremely rational and at the same time controlling philosophy, ideal for the Roman Empire. How can that be adapted once the emperor himself is a Christian? Well, you can watch Eusebius make that adaptation in his work called The Praise of Constantine. Usually when I quote this work, I quote much, much longer excerpts, but I'm controlling the amount of paper I'm using. And the nub of Eusebius' argument, although it is beautifully articulated, is really very simple, and it's put into words just here at the bottom of page two. Our emperor, beloved of God, bearing a kind of image of the supreme rule, as it were, in imitation of the greater, directs the course of all things on the earth. Christ is in heaven, the emperor worships him, the emperor bears the image of Christ to which you are obedient. And for what reason are you obedient? What is your status as an ethical actor within Christianity at this time? A shift is going on within the ideology of the church that corresponds to this change in regard to political theology. And it is that while earlier, as I said, the basic understanding was that the individual Christian is infused with spirit, and it's on that basis that salvation takes place, the Stoics also contribute an idea which had not been dominant in Christianity until this time. The Stoics contribute the idea of the immortality of the soul. 
that is widely looked upon today, for reasons I understand, as being an indigenously Christian notion, it is not. The idea that the soul is immortal is already there in the work of Plato. It's present in the Stoics. It's there embraced within some sectors of Judaism, for example, within a work called The Wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha. But it's not dominantly a Judaic understanding, nor until this period is it predominantly a Christian understanding. But during the fourth century, it becomes so. Instead of the idea that Christ's salvation takes place because each individual is resurrected in the same way that Christ was resurrected, which was the classic form of belief, the idea is increasingly embraced in Christianity that, in fact, the immortal soul survives. And therefore, it has to be prepared to accept the image of God in this life by means of obedience, by means of taking on the character of Christ himself. Christ himself who came into this world not to serve, but to be served, because he himself was a kind of slave. So while free, at one level, spiritually, from slavery, you actually work out your salvation by accepting the constraints of institutions such as slavery. But surely we can make the argument that if we, as followers of Christ, understand that both individually and collectively we are to be more Christ-like, then in our conduct shouldn't we be critical of the institution of slavery? That is exactly the argument that is made, and you'll see this in the next quotation, by Gregory of Nyssa, one of the great theologians of the early church, this writing in 379. So we're still working out this conception in the fourth century. And Gregory is giving this sermon about this time of year, during Lent. And he's doing it by giving a series of homilies on the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. I saw that there was much evil under the sun. And Gregory of Nyssa wishes to remind people that those are the conditions in which we live. It's a very good thought during Lent. And in fact, Ecclesiastes is an appropriate book for that time of year. And so he quotes Ecclesiastes 2.6, I got me slaves and slave girls. And this, by the way, is part of the description in this chapter of Ecclesiastes of all the various kind of wealth that the speaker has accumulated. And he's about to say, with all this wealth, I still realized that everything was vanity. And Gregory is meditating on why he comes to this conclusion I got me slaves and slave girls. For what price? Tell me. What did you find in existence worth as much as this human nature? What price did you put on rationality? How many obols did you reckon the equivalent of the likeness of God? Remember that argument we saw used by Philo of Alexandria against infanticide? Here it is back in Gregory of Nyssa used against slavery. How many staters did you get for selling the being shaped by God? God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. If he is in the likeness of God and rules the whole earth and has been granted authority over everything on earth from God, who is his buyer? Tell me. Who is his seller? To God alone belongs this power, or rather not even to God himself. 
not even to God himself. Once God made you in his image and likeness, you're in his image and likeness. God has the same problem with you that you have with your children. They are ineluctably free. For his gracious gifts, it says, are irrevocable. God would not therefore reduce the human race to slavery since he himself, when we had been enslaved to sin, spontaneously recalled us to freedom. But if God does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? A powerful, one might think, unshakable argument, but I want to observe it's an argument based on the idea that those sitting in the basilica listening to Gregory are preparing their souls by the practice of Lent. He is not making this argument on the basis of statecraft or the laws of the empire because he doesn't yet have an underlying analysis of how society runs that would permit him to make that claim. Those opposed to infanticide had that kind of precedent. Even Gregory, an acute thinker, doesn't have the means at his disposal in order to insist that the entire institution has to be abolished. Instead, He's looking at the question of the practice of slavery by the individual, not at the institution-wide existence of slavery itself. This is also the point of view that Augustine, the Latin father, develops in his great work, The City of God, a work which is concerned with the question of the overarching trajectory of history. How it is that within the terms of conditions of this world, from the very beginning, humanity is headed towards the revelation of its full destiny as the children of God in the city of God. And he sees many current institutions as being under the control of sin such that they must not be regarded as in any way representing the justice of God. And so he writes, and I think it's very clear, he's here dependent on Gregory of Nyssa. If he were writing a senior project, I would demand that he write the footnote to this statement, but it wasn't a senior project. The prime cause of slavery then is sin which brings man under the dominion of his fellow, which does not happen save by the judgment of God, with whom there is no unrighteousness, and who knows how to award fit punishments to every variety of offense. So because sin is of the very essence of slavery, its practice is duly punished, but it exists. It is, for Augustine, still a reality. And so I want to suggest that this understanding, which might, broadly speaking, be called Augustinian in the Western tradition, is one which expects slavery and its aftermath to be dealt with by means of the virtue of individuals. And if you have confidence of that, it also gives you a certain optimism about history. And I want to close with just a few remarks about those who have embraced this profoundly Augustinian understanding, but also suggest that in relying on this alone, one is committing oneself to the picture that you will tear away slavery and what is attached to it after you have made all people virtuous. And that may take you a longer time than you might imagine.
So Theodore Parker, a noted abolitionist thinker from the 19th century, wrote in one of his sermons and gave a metaphor which will be very familiar to you, and you'll see why I quoted these particular examples. Look at the facts of the world, and you see a continual and progressive triumph of the right. There are certain things one can only say during the 19th century, and that is one of them. A continual and progressive triumph of the right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. But from uh, what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. Jefferson trembled when he thought of slavery and remembered that God is just. Ere long, all America will tremble, he said in 1853. And so it did. But would he have thought that after a civil war, we would still be where we are? Yet this Augustinian optimism does not stop. In fact, we know it more through Martin Luther King, who got this metaphor from Parker. So in 1958, he wrote, evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross, but that same Christ arose and split history into AD and BC, so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. He knew how to speak. Yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. There is something in the universe which justifies William Cullen Bryant in saying, truth crushed earth will rise again. And to complete this picture, I also want to cite the way in which Barack Obama applies this same trope. And he applies it as an Augustinian theologian. You know, as surely as Eusebius and Augustine baptized Stoicism, that Stoicism is picked up by Parker and Martin Luther King and then Barack Obama. But I learned in the shadow of an empty steel plant more than two de decades ago, while you can't necessarily bend history to your will, you can do your part to see that, in the words of Dr. King, it bends towards justice. So I hope that you will stand up and do what you can to serve your community. You see what a deeply Augustinian and Pauline thought that is? Serve your community, shape our history, and enrich both your own life and the lives of others across this country. But if it actually takes so long, isn't it necessary for Christianity to find other principles of revolutionary reform, such that it will not be left with the paradoxical revolution in the case of slavery, but will instead actually come to a resolution such that it can remove that which it sees as evil instead of tolerating it. That we will see in two weeks. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, please. Yep, questions are welcomed. Yeah. Pleasure. It's a very good question, and I'll repeat it for the Cardinal's tape. Uh, Paul can say that slaves and free are equal, but in the churches he founded and the churches he served, were they? And that is an answer which I think has to be answered in particular cases, uh, because, for example, after the period of Constantine, 
there were examples when the decision was reached that a slave should not be able to be ordained as a priest. But of course, that's from the post-Constantinian position. In the pre-Constantinian position, when there is a much greater degree of latitude in who you appoint as a priest, there is good evidence that, in fact, slaves did arise to positions of prominence within this, remember, persecuted Christian community. One of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, in fact, the shortest letter, the letter to Philemon, therefore, lots of students in seminary like to write commentaries on Philemon, uh, deals entirely with the institution of a particular slave, where Paul is writing to a slave owner, urging him to start dealing with his slave differently now, because he's come to the point where he has acquired status within the community. So there is evidence, it is sporadic, and one has to sift very carefully, for the rise of slaves to unusual positions. But I would also like to emphasize that there is a precedent for this in the Greco-Roman world that is of individual philosophers and teachers who had originally been slaves coming to be freed people and working on their own. Why should that be the case? Because what are the signs of status in Rome at this time. Of course you want slaves. Of course you want to be well armed. But you also want a Greek tutor for the kids. A Greek tutor for the kids is a sign of status in the way that an au pair used to be in Manhattan during the 1940s. So you take a Greek slave, an educated person, you make this person a tutor, and then, over time, this person might very well make his way. So the institution of slavery in antiquity is one that actually, even at its worst, this is sobering to observe, but I think it has to be observed, even at its worst, it allowed for more flexibility and development than did the American institution of slavery. Our slavery actually in some way became much more fierce than what was practiced in antiquity. We'll have to look at that further on in the series. Why is it that the resources were discovered to attack the whole institution, not merely individual abuses and not merely working on the basis of the individual soul, but to attack it frontally. That requires a different view of the world, a different view of what faith is about, and how it is we should operate. We'll see that view coming together, but it only crystallizes in the period after the Reformation. Sure, my pleasure. Are there other questions or comments? on this gorgeous day. Yes, please, yeah. This is a very good question. Um, how did you become a slave? And how then does that influence uh, your own status within a given position? Uh, the Roman Empire is an empire that maintains itself by conquest. And one of the routine ways for dealing with a conquered land uh, is to sell people into slavery. You want to make sure that you exercise your full power uh, over that area by demolishing uh, the major structures of whatever culture you've taken over. Uh, I'll give the example of what the Romans did uh, in the instance of the Jewish revolt. Uh, which broke out in the year 66. Uh, in that year, the high priest in the temple announced uh, he was no longer uh, 
uh, going to accept any contribution from the emperor in the temple, which was a way of saying that we are not recognizing the legitimacy of the emperor within our worship, uh, and what even hurt worst, we're not going to pay any taxes to Rome. A tax revolt is dealt with very fiercely by the Romans. They send the 10th Legion Fratensis. They invade coming in by way of Damascus to the north of the Sea of Galilee. They actually use barges to come down the Sea of Galilee to attack Jerusalem and Judea from the north. Why? So that they can steamroll across the countryside with their troops and take out entire towns and villages. You round up the populations, the adults you kill, and the children become your slaves. This was how Mary Magdalene died, in all probability, in the year 67, because nothing was left of Magdalene. They come down to Jerusalem. They besiege the city of Jerusalem. It takes them three years to get in because there was a fierce resistance, but they're ultimately successful. And you know, from all of antiquity, we only have one image, exactly one image, of the sacred furniture inside the temple in Jerusalem. And that appears on the Arch of Titus in Rome, because they were the altar of incense, the altar for the showbread, was taken through a parade in Rome, a triumphal procession, along with the high priest in chains and other captives, to show the Roman gods have beat your god, and we own you. By the way, when the Romans took these implements of other cultures, they brought them to a special temple in Rome, and they called this the Temple of Peace. So it was not invented in Westminster Abbey. It actually occurs first in that empire in Rome. So a classic way to get a slave is by means of warfare. And it is for that very reason that writing much later, when John Locke speaks of slavery, he treats of slavery as an institution of warfare. And by the way, Locke speaks of slavery in a way which is embarrassingly positive, seeing it as one of the ways in which you project power. But you can also become a slave because let's say it's not a war of that kind, uh, but is a local tax revolt. There again, the Romans will intervene. A typical way of fining a given locality is to take some of their people as slaves. So as long as there's conquest, there's going to be a pretty good population of slaves available to you. Also, as we were saying last week, a way to make a slave is if a child is a foundling. Uh, you know, in the case of an infanticide which doesn't make it to a possible end, someone picks the child up, the child is then, you don't know whose it is, a slave and belongs to you. Incidentally, it's interesting, Constantine also came up with the edict that if you exposed your child and the child survived and that child became someone's slave, you as the parent could not claim it back again. So interestingly, Constantine is showing what I think is a common Christian sensibility in the fourth century, namely that infanticide as such has to be removed, but slavery simply has to be accommodated. In effect, the argument is for a kinder and gentler slavery, but it is still a form of slavery. And then, yes, what you refer to is also a possibility. If you are very poor, you might very well sell yourself 
into slavery. There's no question about that. And in fact, it's interesting, this moment of manumission or emancipation that Constantine refers to uh, is itself a ambivalent status because let's imagine that I am a fairly uh, expert slave. Uh, let's imagine, I know how to make wine. Right? I'm a slave that can make wine, I know the process, I'm good at it. And because of this, my owner permits me to make some money on the side. I actually sell some of my wine. And that means that over time, I can develop something by way of savings. And so, I'm in a position to be able to buy my freedom. Because of that institution, there are a surprising number of accusations against slaves that they steal. And one reason for this is, owners understand very well that if they gather this money, they're going to buy their freedom. So if you can accuse the slave of having gotten that money from your own pocket, you could extend the period of the slavery. But let's say my owner is a sensible, good person. So I buy my slave. Well, what exactly am I going to do now? I am probably going to stay in the same household. I'll probably do it because I'd like to call myself free. But I, in fact, have no mobility as compared to what, let us say, a Roman citizen would enjoy. It has been estimated that something like 40% of the population of the Roman Empire at any given moment were or had been slaves. So we're not talking about a minor institution. It's interesting that that 40% mark was hit in Virginia just prior to the Civil War. But of course, that number in Virginia was hit when those slaves were slave slaves. They're, that's not slaves plus freed slaves because <laughs> there were very few of the latter. An illustration of how different an institution can be because of the way that it's practiced. Yes, please. The children of slaves were, for the most part, slaves. However, that was not a problem that anyone much liked to face. And this is one reason for which becoming free uh, carried with it some real benefits. That is, ordinarily speaking, the full right of marriage and having children did not belong to you as a slave. And most slaves overall were male. And uh, female slaves were, for the most part, associated with the household. And many of them were regarded as being the sexual property of the paterfamilias. Somehow, the paterfamilias always seems to win in this uh, equation, whether it's infanticide uh, or slavery. I am getting a sign. Oh, good. I'm allowed one more. The cardinal says I'm allowed one more question. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very good question, the issue of the relationship between Roman slavery and ancient Israelite slavery. And one of the reasons I think it's a very good question is that what it points to is that slavery is a very widespread custom. And it typically does have to do, as in the Roman case, with conquest. The reason it's especially striking in the Roman case is that Romans developed war to an industrial scale. They were, in effect, an empire constantly at war. In the Israelite case, you tended to have uh, sporadic warfare, although this results in the concept, which we can see very clearly illustrated in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, 
that there is in fact an entire class of people who are slaves. And this slave population is genealogically computable. That is, they are the people who used to live in the land of Canaan and when we came and occupied it, we took it over and they became our slaves. Now when you have an individual who is your slave, according to the Torah, you keep that slave for seven years and then, uh, you know, this is the associated with the moment that every faculty member loves the sabbatical. You, re you rest the field, right? You rest in the period of seven times seven for the jubilee year. Debts go away. And slavery also comes to an end unless the slave tells the owner, I don't want to leave you. I want to remain attached to this household. And so he literally is. According to the Torah, the owner is to take the slave to the front of the house, to the wooden lintel of the door, and to take a mallet and a large nail. And he is to nail the slave's ear to the doorpost of the lintel. He did say he wanted to be attached to the house. And this, yeah, this becomes a visible way of insisting that the seven-year rule was legally broken in that case. It's amazing what you can get up to uh, once you believe that slavery is not only permissible, but actively mandated. Thanks very much. Nice question.